All right, diuretics, another very, very important part of your um, medications that you will see for the rest of your career. You know, whether you're in psychiatry, OB-GYN, family med, surgery, internal medicine, you will be seeing diuretics in every single one of your patients. So your nice first aid diagram that is going to take us through all of the different medications, their mechanism of action, and where they work. So peek behind the curtain, this is like my third time having to restart for just this section because the diagram confused me. I don't like one and two. So one and two are coming out of the proximal PCT, but in reality, they should be pointed inward because those uh, oxygen and uh, bicarb are going in in this case, but you know, we'll just keep moving forward. Anyways, so number one, what is causing, even though the arrow was pointed outside, H2O to be increased in the proximal convoluted tubule? Mannitol. So our mannitol is our osmotic diuretic drawing high, uh, water into the uh, PCT, into the nephron, and then excrete it. Number two, which is actually increasing the amount of uh, bicarb secreted into, even though the arrow was pointed out, but it is into the uh, nephron. Acetazolamide. We're on a roll. All right. Number three which is increasing the amount of sodium, potassium, and chloride that is kept in the nephron and not absorbed. That is our loop diuretic. Number four, at the distal convoluted tubule, which is inhibiting the sodium chloride pump and keeping sodium and chloride in the nephron. That is our thiazide or thiazide-like diuretic. Finally, which is inhibiting potassium and and hydrogen, keeping them out of the nephron. So by number five, five would be the opposite. So you're inhibiting that uh, channel and you're keeping potassium and hydrogen out of the nephron. And those are our potassium sparing diuretics. All right, so we'll start with our loops. So loop and thiazide, extremely important. You'll see these all the time. So. Our loop diuretic, as we talked about before, we're inhibiting the sodium potassium chloride symporter and the ascending loop of Henle. So therefore, we're actually keeping those substances in the nephron. And so as we know, water follows salt. So we're concentrating this more sodium concentrated in the nephron. And therefore, by that point, we're, we're going to actually cause water to be drawn in more so. These uh, primarily are used for heart failure, and they're used for the edema that we see in heart failure. Your first line, furosemide. You'll see this all the time. This is the drug every heart failure patient is going to be on to reduce the edema, to reduce their pulmonary edema. What tends to be the next step is torsemide. Torsemide's a little bit stronger, so the dosing is a lot less, and uh, you'll have a lot more um, actual diuretic effect. Ethacrinic acid, very, very important high yield fact. This is the one we would use if the patient has a true sulfa allergy. Furosemide and torosemide both have sulfa in their uh, chemical structure. So we use ethacrinic acid if the patient has a sulfa allergy. Very, very important fact. You know, that might, I believe there was a question in your world about that. That's sort of one of those where, you know, we don't study chemical structure, so we don't know, but, you know, you do want to remember that. Lastly, we have bumetanide. So they actually use this a lot more than, uh, than I was led on to in pharmacy school. On the East Coast, this was reserved mostly for patients who had ascites from liver cirrhosis uh, because it has a little bit better bioavailability and when we're bloated and cirrhotic and have this massive ascites, uh, furosemide tends not to be able to cause a diuretic effect in this case. So they use bumetanide. However, in the Midwest, I did my internal meta Lutheran. They primarily used butamide as the second line to furosemide. So, you know, that's not entirely uh, relevant what we're going on for here. Don't worry about that. Just remember, furosemide is our first line for uh, edema and heart failure. Trosemide is our second line because it's a little bit more potent, a little bit stronger effect. Ethacrinic acid is our 
loop diuretic that is used in those with sulfa allergy, and bumetanide has a special effect because it's a little bit more bioavailable, and so we're able to use it in patients with ascites who have liver cirrhosis. Very, very important. There are, I think, this was sort of the drug that is the stereotype for side effects. I'm sure in your list and on this class slide, it was listed out that this drug, or just loop diuretics in general, have 10 to 15 side effects. However, they don't test them all. What they like to test is hypokalemia. Hypokalemia is the clinically, you know, you need to know that loop diuretics cause hypokalemia. They do cause other um, electrolyte abnormalities, hypocalcemia, hypomagnesemia, but the one that they're going to test is hypokalemia. And so this was sort of like the foundation for, you know, why are we doing this? It's because I can tell you out of the 10 loop diuretic side effects that they're not going to ask you the other ones. They're going to ask you about hypokalemia. One of the other ones, back when we weren't able to control heart failure as well, and we had patients who were stage 3 and stage 4 and, and really were, you know, not in good shape before we had some other uh, therapies, they sometimes would get autotoxicity because it can cause uh, some of the loops can cause autotoxicity at higher doses. You don't see that as much anymore, but it's that's another one that they can ask you about. So remember, loops cause hypokalemia. Remember that one. All right, thiazide diuretics. So these are our hydrochlorothiazide, chlorothiazide, metolazone, and dapinide, and chlorothaldone. So these work in our distal convoluted tubule, and these actually inhibit the sodium chloride symporter. So again, like the loop diuretic, we have our sodium chloride symporter bringing that, those two substances in, reabsorbing them from the nephron. If we leave them in, in the nephron, we're going to have a little bit of osmotic diuresis following sodium. These are primarily used for hypertension. They can be used as adjuncts in heart failure, so eventually your diuretic effect from your loops it sort of hits a ceiling. It's called a ceiling effect. Um, sodium can actually be reabsorbed in the distal convoluted tubule after it's absorbed. After it's in, so if sodium is inhibited, if the absorption of sodium is inhibited in your loop of Henle by a loop diuretic, it can still be reabsorbed in your distal convoluted tubule. So you know, at a, at a certain point, the, uh, there's a, a, an effect, maximal effect that's reached. So by also inhibiting the sodium chloride symporter in the distal convoluted tubule, you have a better chance of keeping more sodium in the nephron and having more of a diuretic effect. So they're not used for heart failure in the sense that you know we're trying to remove some of the edema, but we can actually boost the effect of some of the loop diuretics. So thiazides have a few more side effects that you should know. So similarly to loops, they can decrease potassium, uh, sodium, and magnesium. You always want to worry about hypokalemia because that's the most, uh, you know, sort of uh, life-threatening of all of them. But they can also increase cholesterol and glucose. Um, so keep that in mind. It's not uh, totally clinically relevant. Some practitioners will talk about, oh, you know, you have a patient with diabetes. Should I put them on a thiazide diuretic because you could worsen their hyper, um, you know, hyperglycemia? It, it's not the most clinically relevant, but they do like to test it because it has been shown to um, to do both of those things. So, thiazide diuretic, our sodium chloride symport inhibitor in the distal convoluted tubule, primarily used for hypertension. Um, can increase our cholesterol and glucose levels and also has some electrolyte abnormalities that can also cause. So honest to God, these two drugs are probably, you know, two of the more, these two drug classes are two of the more popular ones. You, like this is, you're going to see all of these drugs used when you hit your clinical practice, guaranteed. All right, so now a little bit more um, adjunct e agents, I guess. So we have our potassium sparing diuretics of the mineralocorticoid receptor brand. So that's our spironolactone and a plurinone. So these are specifically inhibiting aldosterone. And if you remember from physiology, our renin angiotensin aldosterone system, by inhibiting aldosterone, we are not um, excreting, uh, we're, we are actually not reabsorbing sodium. In our uh, uh, collecting duct. So 
or distal convoluted tubule. So by doing that, we are able to cause diuresis by, as I said before, more sodium in our nephron is going to be causing an osmotic, uh, an osmotic effect and drawing more water into the nephron. So these are actually primarily used for uh, heart failure and one in primary and secondary hyperaldosteronism. Obviously, the primary and secondary hyperaldosteronism because we want to block the effects of aldosterone and it's being secreted endogenously and uh, heart failure. Now, its use for heart failure is not for its diuretic effect. Its use in heart failure is for its anti-aldosterone effects because you know, if you remember from the pathophysiology of heart failure, we have unregulated RAS, as I just said. So part of that renin angiotensin aldosterone system is the aldosterone part. And so this can be one of the aspects by which we can inhibit the uh, overactive system and stop the aldosterone component. Very high yield. These can cause hyperkalemia. So if you remember, the uh, two transporters by which we're reabsorbing sodium in the distal convoluted tubule work with uh, potassium and they work with hydrogen. So we can cause hyperkalemia and metabolic acidosis because if we're blocking that transporter, we're going to retain potassium and we're going to retain hydrogen ions. In addition, very, very, very high yield side effect, spironolactone can cause gynecomastia, which is the uh, breast-like tissue swelling in men. And the S greater than E is just that it's spironolactone is much more known for this than aplirinone. Aplirinone was actually the drug that was developed because of the side effect. So if we are inhibiting our potassium sparing diuretic, our mineralocorticoid receptor, we are going to cause hyperkalemia and metabolic acidosis. And then spironolactone, you must know, can cause gynecomastia. So both of these medications were great, but what if we can actually just inhibit the sodium channel in the distal convoluted tubule? And so amloride and triamterene were created. So these just block the potassium, sorry, the sodium channels on the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting duct. So we have inhibition of sodium reabsorption in these areas without their aldosterone effects. As I said before, more sodium in our nephron, osmotic diuresis, causing a diuretic effect. These are primarily used for hypertension and can cause some hyperkalemia and uh, hypernatremia. No gonoclomastia side effects. I wouldn't worry too much about these two drugs. The idea here is they were developed as potassium sparing diuretics in response to the gynecomastia side effects of spironolactone. Finally, we have our last couple. So our carbanic anhydrase inhibitor, acetazolamide. As we all know, carbanic anhydrase is part of that wonderful um, uh, wonderful equation of oxygen, uh, um, water and CO2 with carbanic anhydrase eventually gets created into bicarb and uh, uh, hydrogen ions or acid. So this is happening in the lungs and primarily the lungs and the kidney. So in the kidney, by inhibiting carbanic anhydrase in the proximal convoluted tubule, we are decreasing our hydrogen ion, our acid secretion, and but we're also increasing our bicarb secretion. And for whatever reason, by increasing our bicarb secretion, we are actually causing a slight, slight diuresis. Now, we don't really use this as a diuretic because the effect is sort of transient, goes away. And then again, if we do this in the proximal convoluted tubule, you know, there's a whole lot of nephron that comes after that, that can sort of, you know, uh, can can adapt to those changes. So if we make a change in the proximal convoluted tubule, you have to go through the loop of Henle, and then you have to go through the distal convoluted tubule, and then you have the collecting ducts. So, you know, any change we make in the proximal convoluted tubule is, you know, not really, not all of it is going to be seen at the end of the nephron. So they don't really work as well as diuretics. However, because of their effects on secreting bicarb, we can use them for metabolic alkalosis. 
I'm sure you talked about them last year in their use for altitude sickness. And then finally, they're also used in glaucoma, or acetazolamide is used in glaucoma because it decreases the aqueous humor production. Obviously, if we are inhibiting the secretion of uh, hydrogen ions and we're increasing by, or we're increasing the secretion of bicarb, we can cause a metabolic acidosis. All right, mannitol. Mannitol, it's just a direct osmotic agent. So it is literally, uh, you know, a very osmotic uh, uh, molecule that is just drawing uh, H2O into the nephron, or, you know, when it's when it's given IV, it's going to actually draw uh, water from your extravascular space into your intravascular space. So it's primarily used for cerebral edema. Patients come in, massive car accident, they come in, they have a blown pupil, you think they have some sort of subdural or epidural, and uh, or maybe just a cerebral hemorrhage. Your ICP is going way up high, we're prepping them for surgery. What else can we do to reduce some of that intracranial pressure? We can give mannitol, and because the idea is the mannitol and the um, circulation will actually draw any water from the extravascular space. So in our brain, that's our biggest worry, that intracranial pressure rising because of all of that uh, fluid is going to be causing compression and uh, problems. We're going to draw it into the intravascular space. However, it can cause pulmonary edema and it can exacerbate somebody who has uh, chronic kidney disease and throw you into renal failure. So we do not, uh, we are very worrisome about giving it to patients because it can cause those two uh, side effects, pulmonary edema and acute renal failure. Finally, our last two, a little bit lower yield, we have tolvaptan and conovaptan. So these are vasopressin ADH antagonists. So as we know, ADH, antidiuretic hormone, when it's released, it works on the collecting ducts to uh, absorb free water so that we do not, you know, we do not pee, antidiuretics, so we do not have diuresis, and it concentrates our urine. So we're antagonizing the ability to concentrate our urine. So it actually promotes free water excretion. We're primarily worried about the uh, vasopressin 2 uh, receptor. That's the, the receptor primarily responsible for this effect. That's why we have conovaptin, which was the first generation, which is non-specific, working on 1 and 2. And then we have tolvaptin, which was the second generation, which is a little bit more specific on the uh, vasopressin 2 receptor. These are primarily used for euvolemic and hypervolemic hyponatremia. So for whatever reason, SIDDH, uh, uh, what's the other one? SIDH or psychogenic polydipsia, you know, uh, the, the just need to drink a lot of water. We are at a fluid overload state, and we can see that in our sodium level on our Chem 7, that, oh, the, you know, the sodium is down. It's in the 130s or maybe the 120s, and, you know, the kidney function is fine, showing that, you know, for whatever reason, we are, we are fluid overloaded and it's manifesting as hyponatremia. So we can give a vasopressin receptor antagonist to uh, help excrete free water without excreting sodium to help treat hyponatremia. Obviously, side effects are going to be polydipsia and polyuria. If we're excreting more free water, we're going to want to be drinking more, and we're obviously also going to be peeing that water out.